Let's talk a little bit about tongue conditions. We have a few different subcategories here. What's it called when you have inflammation of the tongue? It's not a trick question. It's just called glossitis. Which vitamins are associated with, which vitamin deficiencies, I should say, are associated with glossitis? There's quite a few actually. Iron deficiency, uh, pernicious anemia, which is B12 deficiency, and then all the other vitamin. I guess it's, it's a little redundant with B12 here, but any B vitamin and iron you should consider um, can be associated with glossitis. And with that, what's a condition associated with iron deficiency anemia, dysphagia, and esophageal webs, in addition to glossitis and angular chelitis? That is Plummer-Vinson syndrome, which I talk about in the esophagus lecture. I just want to point out right here, glossitis is one of its conditions right here. So something to keep in mind. What's an enlarged tongue called? Again, not a trick question. That's referred to as macroglossia. Let's go over some conditions, especially childhood disorders that uh, also have macroglossia. You can get mac, what's, what is it called? Which syndrome is it when you have macroglossia in a newborn with upslanting palpebral fissures, a single transverse palmar crease and brush field spots? That's Down syndrome. What about if you had macroglossia, delayed bone growth, intellectual disability, a protruding abdomen and abnormal reflexes in a newborn who never received any prenatal care? This one's a little trickier. This one is congenital hypothyroidism. I always remember that as the, it has a protruding tongue and a protruding abdomen. They always like to give the abdomen and the tongue within the description. So whenever I see both of those, I start to really consider um, congenital hypothyroidism. Last, and so here's a picture of it, sorry about that, of the protruding tongue and the protruding abdomen. Last one, tough one, but I have faith. Uh, macroglossia in a newborn with Wilms tumor, hemihypertrophy, which is where one of your arms or legs is longer than the other or, or wider than the other. You can get omphalocele, which I talk about in the, in the small intestine lecture, I believe. Um, that's where your abdominal contents have actually herniated out at birth. And enlarged visceral organs. This is a rare disease called beckwith weidemann syndrome. And I remember Weidemann by the wide component. You get wide organs, like enlarged visceral organs. You might have one wide arm or one wide leg with this hemihypertrophy. Your abdomen's so wide that it's pushing out and you're causing an omphalocele. Or you can get a Wilms tumor, which would obviously make your, your abdomen or your kidneys wider as well. Again, pretty low yield, but that's just a nice mnemonic if you ever do get tricked up by that one. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about plaques now. What's a white plaque on your tongue that can be scraped off? You see it a lot in people with HIV or other immunocompromising conditions. That is thrush or oral candidiasis, which I've shown here. Remember, you can scrape it. They love that. And you treat it with nystatin. Nystatin, I'm just gonna give you the mechanism because they. I don't know why. I've seen, I've seen a lot of test questions on antifungal mechanism of action. So just don't get tricked. It Nystatin, what it does is it actually just binds ergosterol and it'll form pores in the cell membrane. So it's kind of a cool mechanism. And it's the exact same mechanism as amphotericin B. Okay, so those, those two, just remember those antifungals, they like to punch holes and stuff. What if you found a white plaque on the tongue that cannot be scraped away? And this, this lesion is actually precancerous and can progress to squamous cell carcinoma. This is called leukoplakia, which you can see right here. Remember the difference between the two? You cannot scrape away leukoplakia, but you can scrape away thrush, okay? What about leukoplakia that is on the side of the tongue? It's seen in immunocompromised patients related to EBV, and it's actually a benign condition, okay? This is called hairy cell leukoplakia. So again, you can't scrape it off, but it's on the side and it's associated I've seen this before and they like to test it where they show this and they say, what's it associated? With? And it's EBV infection. How about a red plaque on the tongue caused by dysplasia and has a high risk of progression to a uh, squamous cell? That's erythroplakia. 
and you can see that right here. And that, that already looks cancerous to me. That just looks bad. Okay, last little section on tongue conditions. What if you saw a kid, the, the question talked about a kid who has a strawberry tongue, pharyngitis, a sandpaper rash, anterior cervical lymphadenopathy, and a risk of rheumatic fever or PSGN. I guess if I say what PSGN is, it gives it away. That's a group A strep infection. And PSGN, yeah, it's post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, so a kidney dis disorder following a strep infection. Now contrast this with the next presentation. Oh, actually, scratch what I just said. Let's look at let's look at what a strawberry tongue looks like. So this is a strawberry tongue. You can see that in group A strep and a couple other disorders. And you can see the sandpaper like rash, okay? Now, contrast that with this. What if you have a child with a strawberry tongue, but they also have prolonged fevers, conjunctivitis, they do have a rash, they have cervical lymphadenopathy, they have palmar erythema, so their hands are red, a new cardiac murmur, and you usually treat this disease with aspirin. Anybody know what that is? That is Kawasaki disease. Here's Kawasaki disease. There's a strawberry tongue. Um, the mnemonic, a good way to remember Kawasaki disease is the crash and burn mnemonic. I really like that. I think it was in first aid. You have conjunctivitis. You have a rash. You have adenopathy, a strawberry tongue. You have hand problems. And then the burn is the fever. You have to have a fever lasting at least five days. Okay. And I guarantee you, if you look back at any test question that's had Kawasaki's disease in the past that you've seen, they've always mentioned this fever lasting a long time, five days. And something else they've always mentioned is this conjunctivitis. We don't think about this, but I, I can't remember who told me. I think it was an ER doctor. They said, if you ever want to know the difference between Kawasaki disease and group A strep, either in real life or on a test, Look at if they have conjunctivitis. If they do, it's Kawasaki disease. If they don't have conjunctivitis, it's group A strep. Kind of an interesting thing. And it's actually held true when I've checked back to some of the questions I've gotten wrong in the past. Just keep that in mind. And you treat it with aspirin or IVIG or steroids. And you always have to remember, they love this test question. The complication is a life-threatening aneurysm. So you always have to follow up with echoes for people with Kawasaki, okay? Anybody know what it's called when you have choreiform, which kind of means just like random sporadic tongue movements in a patient with schizophrenia, and you treat this condition by stopping the antipsychotic, or you have to switch medications, or you can give them tetrabenazine or dutetrabenazine. This is called tardive dyskinesia. It's one of the late uh, reactions to prolonged antipsychotic use, especially the typical antipsychotics. Let's move on to the tonsils and the oropharynx real quick. What if you saw a kid who had pharyngitis as a child, anterior cervical lymphadenopathy, and they also the condition also has an association with valvular abnormalities if left untreated? It's not a trick question. This is also group A strep. That valvular abnormalities, that rheumatic fever we talked about earlier. So it's the same thing. And you can see um, one thing, this is more applicable to step two, I believe, maybe even step three, but it's definitely step two more than step one, um, is the centaur criteria, okay? This tells you, basically gives you an idea as a provider. If somebody comes in and you're like, I don't know if I should treat them for strep or if I should test them with a culture or should I just leave them be? This helps you get an idea of how, how likely it is that they actually have strep throat. And so the center criteria, you get one point for each of the following absence of a cough. So you should, if you don't see a cough, you get a point because strep throat does not cause a cough. If you have tonsillar exudates, like the ones that you can see to the right, that gives you a point. If you have tender lymphadenopathy, you'll get a point. If you have elevated temperature, like a fever, you get a point. And this is kind of an interesting little subcategory here. If because strep throat so common in young kids, if you're less than 15, you get a point. But if you're over 44 years old, your your risk of strep throat is so low that you actually deduct a point. Okay, and then you calculate it up. And if your score is zero to one, you usually don't give an antibiotic. You could still culture it, but from the testing perspective, usually if it's zero to one, you don't give an antibiotic. You don't culture it. 
if it's two or three, you should get a wound culture if you're still suspicious, and then you provide an antibiotic after if it's positive. And then if the Centaur score is four or higher, you should treat it without even requiring a wound culture. In real life, this doesn't happen. Like if you have somebody who has all these symptoms, even if their Centaur score is four or five, you're still going to get a rapid strep test. You might as well just to confirm it, just to make sure that you're treating the right thing. Um, but for a test, they do kind of like this. Zero to one, no, no, nothing to be done. Two to three, wound culture usually. And then four or higher, you just treat it. Uh, what I like about the Centaur criteria is that there's an awesome mnemonic that I don't take any credit for, but it's really nice. So check this out. So the Centaur criteria actually has, it's in the name. So the C stands for the absence of cough. The E in Centaur is the exudates. The N is the lymph nodes. The T is the temperature. And the OR is our OR category, where you can get a point if you're less than 15 or minus a point if you're greater than 44. This is not useful for your GI unit. And it might not even be useful for step one or level one, but I don't know. I think it's such a cool mnemonic. I had to add it in for you guys. All right. What if you find a pharyngitis in a teenager who has posterior cervical lymphadenopathy, and this condition is associated with the risk of splenic rupture? Yep, that's mono, if you said, mononucleosis. How about what, what class of viruses cause pharyngitis atypical pneumonias and hemorrhagic cystitis. Uh, the pneumonia is often in close borders and we have a vaccine available for those in the military. That is adenovirus. What if you have a pharyngitis in an unvaccinated person with pseudomembrane formation, severe lymphadenopathy, and there's also a risk of myocarditis or heart failure. So this is caused by diphtheria. So Diphtheria, I have a couple of pictures on the right there. It's a potentially life-threatening condition. You're, on a test, you'll always see it in an unvaccinated person, and they'll specify that. They'll tell you. And this will present with pseudomembranes in the throat. You can see it right here. You can see severe lymphadenopathy, sometimes referred to as bull neck lymphadenopathy. You can see this really severe lymphadenopathy over here. And you can even get myocarditis and death in certain cases. Okay, so let's talk about the mechanism of diphtheria because this is something that is very, very high yield for step one and level one especially. And it's it's always nice to have a refresher on it because I forget it sometimes. So diphtheria, the toxin is encoded by a beta prophage. And so what what is that? That's actually a virus that infects diphtheria. If you have carinid bacterium diphtheria floating around without being infected by this virus, it's not going to give you this huge dip. It's not going to actually give you this really, really severe diphtheria picture. So what happens is that we have diphtheria. A virus is going to come in and inject its own genetic material inside of diphtheria. So you'll actually have the viral material within here now. And that viral material can then release the exotoxin that affects our cells. So how does that work? So we have now we have an infected carinobacterium diphtheria, right? that's going to be able to finally release these diphtheria exotoxins. And it's going to, these exotoxins will enter our cells. Our cells are busy with our ribosomes and our, you know, our, our amino acid chains right here, our developing protein. What these exotoxins do is that they can actually inhibit this whole synthesis by this pathway. And this is the exact same mechanism that Pseudomonas exotoxin A uses to cause a lot of its problems. And so again, on the test, they love, they love this stuff. They love to give you a picture where they describe somebody with classic diphtheria and you know it's diphtheria. And then they say, the exotoxin of this disease has a similar mechanism to the exotoxin of which bacteria. And then, so then you'll have to not only know that it's diphtheria, but you'll have to know it has the same mechanism as pseudomonas. And I guarantee, I don't guarantee it, but highly likely you'll have a question on it, on this specific mechanism. So to diagnose it, you just have to know that they are gram-positive rods. You can see them right here. And I don't know if this will help you. It's when I studied for step one, I had a mnemonic for all the gram-positive rods because micro is so confusing. And I'll just share that right now. You can turn away from the screen if you're kind of sick of this lecture, or you can move on to the esophagus. And I promise I won't be mad. 
Um, for the gram positive rods, I always remembered it with my alphabet mnemonic. You know how we sing A, B, C, D, and then you kind of do the L, M, N, O, P, right? So I remember that. So remember the A, B, C, D is actinomyces, bacillus, clostridia, and then diphtheria, which we're talking about right now. And then for the LMN part, I remember listeria, mycobacteria, and nocardia. I don't know if this is helpful, but at least maybe if you saw a gram-positive rod in the question stem and you look at the answers and you don't see anything with A, B, C, D, LMN, maybe that'll at least rule, rule some of those out for you. I'm not sure. Take this for what you, you want. Okay, and then they like to make sure that you know it can grow on Loeffler's media and Telluride agar. And the last thing they like you to know is that the ELEC test is what actually identifies the toxin. Okay, we've talked way too much about diphtheria in a GI lecture series, but that's okay. We'll move on. What if you find a child with severe acute dysphagia, drooling, fevers, he's in the tripod position, his, there's a thumbprint sign classically on x-ray, and this can be a fatal disease. It's very rapidly progressive. This is epiglottitis caused by Haemophilus influenza. You can see a picture on the left. They probably won't show the picture to the left. They like to show the picture on the right because they like this thumbprint sign. They love that. Epiglottitis. Don't forget that. What if you see painful blisters affecting infants and children? Uh, usually during the summer months, caused by Coxsackie A virus and self-limiting. This is herpangina. Like I said, it's, it's self-limiting, but it can prevent some children from eating and drinking enough because it's so painful. So that's the only thing you really have to monitor with that. Otherwise, completely benign. What if you find an adult male who develops a severe fever, drooling, and odynophagia? Remember, that's painful swallowing days after having a fish bone stuck in his throat. This condition also may progress to acute necrotizing mediastinitis. Very rare, very, very rare, but it's a retropharyngeal abscess. And honestly, I could have given you the physic. What will happen on a presentation is that they might mention somebody who you know choked on some food, but they'll definitely mention, hey, on this physical exam, you can see this mass in the back of the throat or something. They'll say something like that. I was kind of playing a little hard to get there, but that's something to keep in mind. Very low yield, I'd say. Maybe more of a step two or like a surgery specific thing on your shelf, but I wouldn't worry too much about that. one. And this is kind of a fun one. Most common cause of snoring in children. Anybody know? This might be on your peds shelf. Otherwise, it's useless. Uh, tonsillar hypertrophy. So your tonsils can get too big, can cause snoring. And sometimes that's why they remove them. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please like, comment, and subscribe for more content.